Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. There are many that believe that the solution for our fractured politics is simply for individuals to take power from the grassroots, that bottom-up organizing is the antidote to the wave of authoritarianism that is sweeping the world. The counter-argument to that is that even with committed grassroots efforts, charismatic and effective leadership is essential. Vietnam in the 60s represented the end of consensus politics in America. Since that time, we've been searching for the politician or the leader that could restore that consensus. The irony has been that in a time of polarity, it's been impossible for that leader to emerge. So we look back to what might have been. And when we do, the image, the mythology, and the reality of Bobby Kennedy rises as an apparition from the body politic. Bobby Kennedy had a unique ability to match an empathetic and compassionate agenda with the instincts of a street fighter. We're going to talk about Bobby Kennedy today with my guest, Richard Allen. He's a media and technology executive who's been involved in national politics. He served as deputy assistant to President Clinton, helping to create AmeriCorps. And he is the co-author of RFK, His Words for Our Times. It was originally released back in 1993 and has been re-released now to mark the 50th anniversary of Robert Kennedy's assassination. It is my pleasure to welcome Richard Allen here to talk about RFK, his words for our times. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure, Jeff. Great to have you here. One of the things that is so remarkable is that all these years later with Robert Kennedy, that the fascination, not just with him as an individual, not just the, the sort of social aspect of Robert Kennedy, the cultural aspect of Robert Kennedy, but the political aspect has so much relevance today. Talk a little about that first. I think that's absolutely right. And while you and I are both students of history and love it, and the impetus for this new edition, which is a completely new edition, is motivated by the fact of the 50th anniversary of Senator Kennedy's last campaign. It really is the relevancy of him, his words, his politics, his policies to our times that motivated uh, our book. Similarly to 1968, we've got an enormously divided country. And as you said in that eloquent opening, you had in Senator Kennedy a smart, tough, and principled leader and I think what we show in our book by providing his principal public remarks over the course of his career is that his words could elevate and inspire us and did uh, in the America of that time and do still. And if you knit that together with the practical solutions, he champion to improve the lives of all Americans, not just himself and his cronies, uh, and then harness that to a political engine that made common cause within the working class and those aspired to be part of the working class and, and appealed to all who respected that, that you had a winning proposition. But I think you've put your finger on a key element of it, which was his actual toughness and the fact that that was widely perceived by the American electorate. And and the amazing thing in looking at so much of this in terms of his, his writings and his speeches is how contemporary some of it feels today. I want to take yeah. a minute here. One of, one of his greatest speeches was the one he gave in South Africa at the University of Cape Town two year, exactly two years before his death. I want to play just one minute from that speech and, and let our listeners hear this. If we would lead outside our own borders, if we would help those who need our assistance, if we would meet our responsibilities to mankind, we must first, all of us, demolish the borders which history has erected between men within our own nations, barriers of race and religion, social class and ignorance. Our answer is the world's hope. It is to rely on youth. The cruelties and the obstacles of this swiftly changing planet will not yield to obsolete dogmas and outworn slogans. It cannot be moved by those who cling to a present which is already dying 
who prefer the illusion of security to the excitement and danger which comes with even the most peaceful progress. This world demands the qualities of youth, not a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the life of ease. I mean, we could have been listening to that, uh, somebody delivering that in Silicon Valley or at Stanford today. I think that's absolutely right. The words resonate. And again, I think you have to tie them to the practical solutions that Kennedy espoused and to a political force that he helped to create. But it is interesting to think about the impact that he had within South Africa of that time of 1966, deeply in the midst of apartheid. The government of South Africa, uh, South Africa tried to keep him out of the country. The invitation he was extended from that university at Cape Town was attempted to be rescinded, and they continued to kind of block his efforts to come into the country before they finally yielded and allowed him. And in a very brief period of time, he electrified the, the country. We went back and I, I had pulled from the morgues of the principal South African newspapers the coverage of that trip. And they would put six to eight reporters on him because he was in constant motion almost 24-7. And there were so many appearances, and they were so revolutionary <clears throat> for South Africa at that time and so impactful that the entire newspaper ended up being uh, devoted to him. And the impact on the ANC uh, at that point, living underground with Mandela on Robben Island, was also extraordinary. They told the... Uh, head of the JFK Presidential Library many years later in the 1990s that Kennedy's speech helped to sustain them and sustain the movement because it indicated that someone of power and prominence, he was probably the most well-known American politician in 1966, uh, knew of their struggle, supported their struggle, and had come to their country to voice that and to carry their message to the world. That That's the impact of an extraordinary man. But for our times, those lessons can not only resonate but motivate us. He also talks a lot about, particularly during in that speech, and particularly during that period, about America's place in the world. And, and it's, it's really interesting going back and reading this and listening to it because there's a fine line between reading it as almost a neocon speech in that time and somebody that really did see the U.S. as, as this kind of beacon of liberty that could be achieved with soft power as well. That's absolutely true, and I think it's a it's a really profound distinction that you've pointed to, and and Kennedy was very clear in trying to articulate that. He believed that our relationship with the rest of the world had to be centered on what he felt were the common aspirations of human beings everywhere, but recognizing that, as he said, all nations do not develop in the same manner or at the same pace. Uh, and, and so that reality was central to the way that he felt America should operate in the context of a world community. When you look at all of his, his work, as you do in this book, Talk about the the places that you see that it really had real impact in this country. Other than the mythology, where did the, the rhetoric and the compassion, where did that have a real impact even after his assassination? Well, I think the impact here in the United States was in part forging a coalition that has been difficult 
to maintain in the years since, but is critical for us to do so. And that really centered on the common man and, and women, uh, the Polish American steel worker, the African American mechanic, the Hispanic American farm worker, the Native American activist. He understood, Kennedy understood and respected the first part of those hyphens, right? That heritage. But he was so determined to make the second part of it, the common title of American, mean an equal chance for each of us. And you may have read, Jeff, a, a terrific op-ed piece in the New York Times about a month ago by Richard Kallenberg of the mm -hmm. Century Foundation, who said that Kennedy's playbook was for what Kallenberg called an inclusive populism, a liberalism without elitism, a populism without racism. And I think that combination is an accurate reflection of Kennedy's appeal and is applicable and, and indeed essential today if you're going to see a reconciliation across the political divides and a new spirit of progressivism within America. It's interesting, though, the way in which that idea has been perverted even by the Democratic Party over the years, to a kind of identity politics that is not inclusive in that sense? I think Kennedy kept trying to enunciate what we held in common. And you spoke of his enormous empathy, which was one of the elements of his character that, that made him so popular and and vibratingly uh, popular in 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 terms of the uh, the public of the time, and it it turned on trying to describe the lives of other Americans so that their conditions were well understood by people of very different backgrounds and experiences. But we could see that we were all facing a common set of problems that just played out differently based on our background experience and, and circumstances of the time. And by talking about the problems faced by inner city African Americans and talking with equal passion about the conditions of coal miners, white coal miners, in Appalachia, who had been abandoned by the government where the private sector had left and the good jobs were gone, you really started to transcend those identity politics by realizing that the struggle for opportunity was something we all shared, and therefore the job of the government was to reflect that and empower it. When you look at all of his work, Talk a little bit about the progression that you see with respect to how he came to these ideas. He came to them with a lot of work. Um, he did a number of things over the course of his life, and especially so after the murder of his brother, to educate himself on, on a wide range of issues. The fact that he was voracious is widely commented on by his staff and friends and those who knew him during that time. He read exceptionally widely, but he talked to people and sought out perspectives uh, even more widely. And, and as has been commented on, he mainly listened. He asked lots and lots of questions. And he tried to educate himself so that he could understand and therefore be able to communicate what the conditions were that Americans were facing. And you saw it in his trips to the Mississippi Delta to understand rural poverty in America and the time he spent, times he spent with the farm workers 
out in California. All of those were fact-finding missions. They were politically taking his own prestige and applying it on behalf of groups that were that had been marginalized to try to bring uh, to, to literally capture the TV cameras of America and be able to show his fellow Americans what people were facing in these struggles. Uh, and I think that combination of reading a lot and seeking out information from everyone, from experts, from ordinary Americans, uh, and doing the hard work to really try to understand were incredibly compelling uh, within the context of his political leadership and his public appeal. What do you think people get wrong in understanding Bobby Kennedy? I think it's easy after all of these years to mythologize him mm -hmm. and miss the toughness that you said at the outset uh, of this segment. I think that the the toughness was an important element of his character. Um, and so I think people miss that. I think they also miss the incredible spirit of adventure uh, and the way that he lived his life. That's not uh, appreciated by some and not as present in, in modern politicians. And this is somebody with a great sense of fun and an enormous amount uh, of adventure. And the book is filled with examples of that, whether it's his time in the Amazon uh, or climbing what had been renamed as Mount Kennedy and others. He was a man in constant motion who pushed himself and others. And it's hard to imagine that energy in an era where the President of the United States spends a substantial portion of his time on a golf course. <laughs> Why do you think it has been so difficult for anyone to, you know, imitates the wrong word, but we'll use it, to imitate or capture the same spirit of toughness and empathy and compassion that he did? Well, just in the way you frame the question, I think is part of the answer. You're combining things that most of us would call opposites. And that's difficult for any two characteristics in any individual. I think many have tried. Robert Kennedy certainly benefited from the fact that his brother was a widely loved president who was regarded as having been martyred. And that certainly gave greater credence to Robert Kennedy as his brother and and spiritual as well as uh, genealogical heir. Um, and so I think you know, those conditions are, are very difficult to replicate. But part of it is the willingness to do the hard work. This was something that Peter Edelman, who was one of Senator Kennedy's two principal legislative assistance mentioned earlier this week at, at an event that we were both at Kennedy just worked incredibly hard and he took the requirements of the legislative process seriously and he wanted to see things actually done and when those roads closed down which they did at various times and in various ways he took a direct personal approach, and on a on a big scale, you see that in the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation, which continues to exist today, and which came together because of the enormous energy of Senator Kennedy and the work of his staff to harness the private sector uh, in New York and elsewhere, government support, 
and mainly community leadership to identify what the principal problems were in that, at the time, desperately, desperately poor section of Brooklyn and come up with plans that the community not only bought into but really had articulated and stood behind. That was something that Kennedy did really kind of outside the normal structure of government because he wanted to have a model that could scale. He knew it needed to get done, and he was impatient. And that impatience was also a key characteristic that I think made him unique and and perhaps is harder to achieve uh, now and some, some for some of our leaders. Mm-hmm. He also understood the value not just of, of doing things, but of but of convincing people of the merits of what he was doing, not just selling it, but really trying to make it clear how people would benefit. Well, and, and again, I point to, to Bed-Stuy mm-hmm. as, a, as an example of that because he, he was fed up with programs for the sake of programs. He didn't believe that government was necessarily the solution for every problem. He thought that for major problems, it was clear government had to play a role. But he was very pragmatic. And if you're trying to make a difference, you had better show results and be held to them. And that was something that, again, he insisted on. And, you know, Jeff, I think it's part of a a sense of patriotism that is not defined as such as much today as it should be. And that is, I think his patriotism was a, an effort to constantly improve our country, ourselves, a lot of others, not some, I don't know, blind allegiance that we had made a perfect nation and all we had to do was find some way to recapture that kind of, you know, imagined past. It it wasn't that America was exceptional because it had solved all of her problems, but that we were constantly seeking better solutions to, to reach our objectives and our ideals. Talk a little bit about this volume, about the book and about what's included in it. Thank you. Uh, There are three parts to the book. The core of it are very lengthy excerpts from his principal public remarks. The audio that you played from the famous Cape Town speech, which frankly is my favorite speech, as difficult as it is to pick the favorite among so many great ones, that's there in full. And Many of the major addresses are there in full, and they're all there in media excerpts. The second part of the book is the contextual narrative weave around the speeches and writings so that you understand what was going on in Kennedy's life and in the life of the nation at the time. And then the introduction to the book, or a series of half-page to a page reflections by notable leaders from around the world, what impact Kennedy has had on them personally and the impact they believe he's had on their country and and on the world. We have five Nobel Peace Prize winners, four presidents, the winner of 22 Grammys, some very unique and unusual leaders And the reflections are really, really extraordinary because of that mixture of impact on the writer as well as on the broader society. Mm -hmm. Talk a little about that Cape Town speech. When when people talk about Kennedy's speeches, it doesn't always get the attention that it should. Well, that one probably had the bears the fingerprints of more writers than almost any in this volume. Hmm. And I suppose it's worthwhile to talk for just a second about how Kennedy worked with speech writers. He was himself a very talented writer, and the book begins with 
excerpts from three bylined articles that he wrote for the Boston Post in 1948 as the British mandate in Palestine was ending and the new state of Israel was about to be declared. And Kennedy went there as a byline reporter. And that's an indication at 22 years old that this was somebody who already understood the English language well and, and, and could harness it. And he continued with that throughout his career. But obviously, as he grew to become a public official and the demands on his time expanded, he did have help from others. But it was in a carefully managed process where he would spend a lot of time describing exactly what he wanted to convey in the speech. And then there would be iterative drafts back and forth uh, until it, until he got what he wanted. And he'd continue to change it right up until the moment that he walked up to the podium. And I've actually had the podium drafts in many of the major speeches. And you, you can see in his kind of crabbed handwriting where he's dropped things in at the very last moment, pulled stuff out, really tried to express even the, the nuances down to individual words to make sure he was communicating it. And in the Cape Town speech, some famous names to students of American history uh, played a role here. Allard Lowenstein, who had had a long history with South Africa, made, <clears throat> pardon me, a number of r really important suggestions and toughened the speech up. Uh, but this was also uh, a m major address that Adam Walensky, who was one with Peter Edelman, were the two uh, principal legislative aides, spent uh, a tremendous amount of time on and, and accompanied Kennedy on that trip. Uh, and there were others who contributed. But in its totality, it's just a magnificent, magnificent speech. And, and interesting that it was delivered exactly two years to the day before the assassination. Yes. Yes. Richard Allen, the book is RFK, His Words for Our Times. It's just out from William Morrow. Richard, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Jeff. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.